Hello, my name is Amber Brown and I'm a member of the Dole Institute's Student Advisory Board, the official student group of the Institute. The Student Advisory Board is a bipartisan group whose members have access to exciting opportunities through their involvement in the Institute. This includes volunteering for event evening programs and networking with our special guests. If you are a student and would like to join, please contact us by emailing dolesab at ku.edu. Welcome to the Dole Institute of Politics and thank you for attending today's program presented by the Department of Military History at the Command and General Staff College at Fort Leavenworth. After the program, we will have some time for the audience to ask questions. If you have a question, please raise your hand and a student worker with a microphone will come to you. Please stand if you are able and ask just one brief question. The Dolt Institute's mission is to foster civil and respectful discussion around important and often difficult topics. Please phrase your questions with this in mind. Before we begin, I'd like to remind you to please turn off your cell phones. And now, please join me in welcoming Dr. Sean Kalick, the Director of the Department of Military History. Hi, good afternoon, and thanks to the Dolan Institute for this awesome program. And I get the pleasure of introducing Dr. Amanda Nagel, who got her PhD from the University of Mississippi, specializing in African American history and global conflict, which is pretty impressive, especially with this great topic today, right? She started at the University of Mississippi, uh, Winona State in Minnesota, the United States Military Academy at SAMS, which is a second year course at CGSC, and now we have the awesome pleasure of having her as one of our professors in the Department of Military History. So without further ado, here's Dr. Amanda Nagel. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Kalik, for the introduction, um, and uh, thank you all for coming today. So today I'm going to be talking about William McKinley um, during his time with the Spanish-American War mostly, and a little bit with the Philippine-American War. Uh, it dovetails with the time period that I study. Uh, so uh, William McKinley is a, a and one of the many uh, Ohio politicians um, who, uh, who populated mm, the halls of Congress, the presidency, you name it, after the Civil War. Uh, he, uh, is a lifelong, he was a lifelong Methodist. He was born in 1843 and lived in Ohio for most of his formative years, uh, graduating from a local Presbyterian seminary in 1859. Now, during that time, his parents instilled in him this very strong work ethic, respectfulness, and, and values of prayer and honesty. So that just kind of gives you an idea of who he was as a person and, and kind of what, where he was uh, in his formative years that, that led him to kind of the, the way he approached um, his political career. So he did attempt to attend Allegheny College, and notice I said attempt. He got through about maybe half the year before he dropped out, um, and instead he, uh, he did a few odd jobs until he became a school teacher. Then when the Civil War breaks out in 1861, he is one of the young men who does volunteer for the state of Ohio um, and becomes part of the 23rd Ohio Volunteer Infantry as a private. He was present at Antietam in 1862. So this is going to be something that actually influences him in terms of thinking about war and warfare during his presidency. Um, so uh, after he receives a commission, uh, Second Lieutenant uh, McKinley uh, starts advancing through, through the ranks and he will eventually serve on Colonel, Colonel Rutherford B. Hayes's staff. So yes, a, another future Ohioan who becomes president, right? <laughs> right? Another, another Ohioan who be becomes a president, right? He, he, so he is, he is well ingrained in, in, in terms of, um, of the, the political and, and um, military uh, lineage from Ohio. So when the war ends, this is actually when he does choose to become a, a politician. And so he first attends the Albany Law School and then enters Ohio politics in 1869, which is actually, in fact, the same year that he met his wife, who is pictured with him in the top left um, on the slide. Um, so uh, Ida Saxon was her name. He will run for Congress in 1876, and he serves in the House of Representatives until 1891, um, when there's a backlash to the McKinley Tariff of 1890, uh, and he loses his seat. But, very quickly, 
uh, he runs for and becomes elected governor of Ohio. So during his time as governor, it became clear what kind of a politician he was going to be. Skilled and able, who became known as a compromiser, an important negotiating skill that is gonna actually serve him very well as president. Um, while he was not considered by some a quote unquote take charge leader, um, he could also bring in the votes. Uh, and he could win political negotiations, according to uh, Theodore Roosevelt, quote, apparently without struggle. So um, he's, he's really savvy, and he was once described as someone who found others uh, useful, depending, quote, upon the advantage he could derive from them. Now, uh, that, that, that goes in line with uh, the, the, the longer quote is that, um, and, and I'm paraphrasing here, that he, loves, he loved one person and that was his wife. Everyone else was treated equally, but then it became what they could do for him. And that, was, that, was, that determined how he interacted with, uh, with, with, with other politicians, uh, other people, all of that. And so McKinley will win the nomination for president uh, of the Republican presidential nomination in 1896 on the first ballot. Now, of course, there's a lot of intrigue uh, and, and um, suggestions, intimations, uh, bordering on accusations, that uh, his industrial friend Mark Hanna, um, depicted here uh, on the slide, right, the boss Hanna, um, <laughs> that he bought some of the Republican votes. Uh, from, uh, from other candidates, including Thomas Reed, who you can see he's depicted right here. He's the very last person that the elephant is crushing on his way through the nomination. <laughs> um, so uh, by winning this, it's, it, it's, he's, going to, um, he's going to also then go right through and win the presidency. Um, against William Jennings Bryan, the Democratic nominee that year who championed the free silver movement, right, seeking to take the U.S. off the gold standard. Now, McKinley, of course, he's going to have many concerns domestically, right, the effects of the Panic of 1893, uh, the expansion of Jim Crow in the United States after Plessy v. Ferguson, cements separate but equal, the excesses of the Gilded Age and labor unrest as a result of that, um, and actually, a crisis of masculinity, uh, manhood, in, um, these are just some of the domestic concerns, right? This fear that, especially with women gaining the right to vote in some of the Western states, that politics is somehow becoming effeminate, right? And there's this, 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 this concern over masculinity in the United States and what it means to be a man and to be manly. Um, and so those are just some of his domestic concerns. Now, in terms of foreign policy, of course, his main areas of concern were Cuba and East Asia, uh, as well as the growing anti-imperialist movement in the United States. But he also had very limited experience in either foreign affairs or diplomacy. So this actually come, now gets us to the gentleman on the slide. Okay. Um, he's going to turn, once he, once he is elected president and before he takes, uh, he takes office, one of the first people he's going to actually turn to is pictured here on the, the top right. That is Henry Cabot Lodge. Um, and uh, Lodge um, will provide plenty of advice about Cuba and what to do. But one of the other uh, things that, that, that Lodge is going to try to do is um, try to get his friend, very close friend, probably best friends, best friend, uh, Theodore Roosevelt, a position in the new administration. Didn't necessarily matter which position, but just try to secure Roosevelt a position. Now, during their discussions, McKinley makes it clear to Lodge that he did not want to launch a war as soon as he got into office, uh, hoping that the Cuban crisis would settle a little bit after he was, uh, before he was sworn in. So what I mean by that is, is in 1895, due to repressive Spanish rule, um, uh, people in Cuba revolted. Um, so Spain responds um, very brutally and... Um, creates this, this, what's referred to as the Reconcentrado campaign, right? So it basically is relocating and concentrating Cuban peoples into camps where theoretically they could not aid the rebels, right? 
uh, approximately 300,000 people um, were placed into these reconcentrado camps. Um, and this, of course, enraged the American public um, and led to many raising money and even um, some sailing to Cuba and helping the nationalists fight uh, against Spain. Now, as a result, um, m a lot of American businesses that are invested in the island become very concerned uh, about their financial investments because the U.S. by this point in time had, had heavily invested um, in, in, in Cuba, and so it becomes an economic concern. Well, meanwhile, uh, both Lodge and Roosevelt uh, are seeking a war. Doesn't matter where, they just want a war. <laughs> that's just <laughs> that's just that was just kind of the, kind of the feeling at the time, right? The, uh, they they would have been referred to as jingo uh, j uh, jingoists, right? Um, they wanted a war. They were looking for that. In in some cases, it's because of um, their own experiences within their family and whether or not their par their their fathers served in the Civil War, right? Um, but this is also a time period when, again, it's, it's all about this idea of honor, courage, manhood, like, and, and what it means to be a man. Therefore, war, it, war makes men. So, what best to do but have a, have a war, which can then re reinvigorate that for the United States. At the same time, it's all about U.S. interests and, and what will benefit the United States um, completely, right? And, Add that to many of the other things that, that I mentioned in terms of domestic unrest. The fear of, of, uh, of those things at home means you're going to start looking for enemies abroad, right? So um, that is something that, that, that they're, they're, they're thinking about. And so they're going to support it, what's referred to as a, it's Cuba Libre, um, the, that revolution. And in Roosevelt's case, um, as Lodge is trying to do this, this, this backdoor negotiation with, with McKinley, Roosevelt is supposed to keep it mum that he, like, he's, in, uh, he's in support of, of Cuba Libre. Um, he doesn't. He's vocal enough, and uh, it obviously gets back to McKinley, and that actually stalls the possibility of a position in the new administration. Now, of course, in the end, uh, Roosevelt does secure the position as Assistant Secretary of the Navy. Now, uh, during uh, McKinley's in inauguration, he will assert that the United States wanted, quote, no wars of conquest. Right? Instead, the country should, quote, avoid the temptation of territorial aggression. War should never be entered upon until every agency of peace has failed. Peace is preferable to war in almost every contingency. Now afterwards, right, and this is also, right, the, like, notice I said almost every contingency. That almost is what those two men started to, to think about. Like, oh, almost, huh, maybe, maybe, just maybe, <sighs> this can happen, right? Now afterwards, uh, after his inauguration, McKinley will privately say um, to Carl Schultz, but you may be sure there will be no jingo nonsense under my administration. Yeah, there's going to be plenty of nonsense of this kind. <laughs> and, not just, and, and not just from uh, these two gentlemen, but also it, it, you know, in, in McKinley himself. So this, comes to, this brings us to this last picture. So this is a photograph of uh, William Randolph Hearst. Yeah, yes, a very famous, very, very famous journalist um, who uh, made his name through printing things like this political cartoon uh, on, uh, uh, on the right. Um, he, uh, he would be referred to as, 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 as a yellow journalist, right? Um, and he's going to um, print exaggerated stories as well as, quite frankly, outright lies. Like, he actually, um, he actually would tell his journalists, like, if there's no story, make it up. Like, and I'm, I'm paraphrasing, but that was basically the idea, is that if there's no story there, we're going to make a story. And, and he f so he focused on um, these sorts of things. And so what he's going to actually do is, is when it comes to, so this is actually, um, this was printed two days after the Republican uh, nomination was secured by McKinley. 
and it very much is painting McKinley in a, in a very poor light. And this is not the last time that that will happen. And so after the inauguration, Hearst actually dismisses McKinley's promise to avoid wars, uh, calling, calling this promise, quote, vague and sapless. Right? If McKinley wasn't going to start a war, Hearst most assuredly was. Oh, yeah, that's, that's kind of how he thought about it himself, too, is that he, he viewed that, that he, had the, he had the ability to, to, to do this. And so he, he would continue to stoke emotions of the American public uh, to ensure that war over Cuba was going to happen. Right? So his brand, brand of journalists looked to create sensation um, and outrage. And so... Uh, the New York Journal had been publishing on the Cuban crisis since 1895, driving much of the misinformation that actually spread around the United States um, that influenced both the American public and politicians alike. So in some cases, some, some historians have, have, have said that it, it's not clear if McKinley read the journal, the New York Journal, but... Many other publications used the New York Journal to then publish stories. So regardless, even if politicians or even specifically um, people in the McKinley administration were not reading the journal, that misinformation and what we call now misinformation and disinformation was getting to them anyway. Right? And so it was the, because newspapers were the source of information in the day. So that was how you gathered anything or anything about, about any topic. Um, so by May of 1897, Roosevelt um, starts begin, uh, beginning to um, set out his own agenda for expansion and war from his seat in, in, uh, with the Secretary of the Navy. So it's something McKinley was looking to avoid entirely and why he really didn't want to give Roosevelt a position <laughs> in his administration. Um, now, the action that he took to indicate this agenda, he wrote a letter to Captain Alfred Thayer Mahan saying that if uh, Roosevelt himself could set the policy, the US would annex Hawaii tomorrow. Um, and Roosevelt thought that this was the only way to beat Japan to the punch, because Japan was a, a growing power at this time as well, uh, and looking, looking to expand and, and, and create their own, their, their own empire um, and, and affect the balance of power in East Asia. So Roosevelt will even go so far as contact the Naval War College with a hypothetical scenario, asking what size force would be necessary if Japan demanded the Hawaiian Islands and for the US to intervene, um, with the caveat of possible complications of Cuba diverting some of the forces. Like, what, 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 what size force would we actually need to deal with this problem, right? Um, and so with that, he's also going to be one of the proponents of a larger navy with new battleships um, to secure this sort of expansion, in spite of what the Navy Secretary John Long wanted for his department. Um, so Roosevelt goes actually around <laughs> the, the Navy Secretary <laughs> to negotiate with, uh, with McKinley directly for a bigger Navy while Long is out of town. <laughs> right, so this is, this, is, this is what McKinley is dealing with, <laughs> right? So he's trying, he's trying to find ways to deal with these sorts of personalities um, in the press and in his own administration and in Congress. Um, and so these are some of the challenges that he's got. And so by late September of 1897, uh, he sends a diplomat to negotiate with Spain to try to at least encourage some autonomy for Cuba. Now, for him, this was really to avoid potential conflict, right? uh, both with Spain and potentially also with Japan um, in, in Asia. He also knew that conflict might be unavoidable, but he was cognizant of the feelings of, 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 of the American public at, at the turn of the century. So, hearkening back to his Civil War experience, he's trying to avoid war at all costs. He saw the costs at Antietam, and he did not feel unless he absolutely had to, that he would send, um, that he would send uh, the, the nation, the, the military abroad um, for these sorts of opportunities, right? He, he really um, did not want to 
do this if he did not have to, right? Uh, but war and conquest were on the minds of the American public, um, aided by publications like the New York Journal, um, glorifying the heroics of men at war and this, these jingoist pieces asserting how beneficial war could be to the United States, um, economically, politically, right? Um, and, and essentially culturally. So this is directly tied to, the, this is where that, that tie to um, manhood, masculinity is as well. Um, because there's this critique, as I mentioned earlier, of, of the uh, um, effeminization of politics. And so what that means, uh, at least for, for some jingoists, was that negotiations and arbitration, that's not how you do this. Instead, you emphasize martial ideas of honor and physical power to settle disputes. You don't negotiate. Negotiate is, negotiating is not what men do, right? So that's kind of how, um, th that's kind of how some of these men are, and particularly these three um, on the slide are looking at this. And so McKinley is trying to deal with this sort of thing. Uh, and he's also got uh, people like the Secretary of War, Elihu Root, saying, quote, politics is modified war. In politics, there is struggle, strife, contention, bitterness, heart-burning excitement, agitation, everything, which is adverse to the true character of woman. Ah, right? So you can see the, the languages and the way that they're thinking about this. So by 1897, this idea of keeping politics, quote unquote, male, right, is essential. And politicians then needed to appear as manly as possible to convince their uh, electorate to support them. So McKinley, of course, then has to walk this very fine line to avoid war as long as possible, but also not let um, foreign policy challenges um, lead to diminishing the nation's honor. Right? Um, so late 1897, we get a reprieve, a, a bit, in, in Cuba. There's a new liberal government in Spain after an assassination, um, and there's attempts to seek peace with the rebels in Cuba. So through diplomatic pressure, McKinley and his administration was actually, they were actually able to influence Spain to begin discussing this idea, uh, the, the, the concept of just freeing people who are in the reconcentrado camps, right? Um, and also offer some kind of self-governance to Cuba. Now, McKinley is going to then ask the American public and also, of course, Congress to give this a chance. Right? Immediately, Hearst's New York Journal said that the president's statement was, quote, lacking in virility, worse than mild, timid, cringing. Right? So meanwhile, right, even though Roosevelt actually commended McKinley's approach uh, to, quote, uphold the honor of the country while avoiding this potential war with Spain, he continued his jingoist pursuits regarding Cuba. So he's going to write to the former head of the Naval War College um, uh, and uh, ask about U.S., the, uh, uh, and, and essentially argue that the U.S. intervening in Cuba would not just be for humanitarian interests or self-interest. It would be instead, quote, for the benefit done our military forces by trying both the Navy and Army in actual practice. Okay? So for him, it's as if war was a game or equivalent to peacetime maneuvers or training. But of course, war means we're going to lose American lives. So he thought it, uh, quote, it would be a great lesson and we would profit much by it. So, events in January of 1898, of course, start shifting this, and McKinley's put in a much uh, more difficult position. So, in about mid-January, uh, there's rioting that erupts in Havana. So, pro-Spanish loyalists start attacking newspaper offices that backed self-governance. Um, instead of bringing peace, to Cuba, uh, the Spanish concessions actually led to hardening of positions on both sides. Um, rebels were emboldened by the impression that Spain was on the edge of defeat. Now, loyalists uh, opposed uh, 
uh, autonomous colonial governments, right? So there's, there's this push-pull, um, and military conflict uh, between the two sides had already reached a bit of a stalemate because both sides were, quite frankly, exhausted. Um, so it, the, the exhaustion of resources, personnel, etc. cetera. Um, so Hearst will claim that American citizens were being attacked in Havana. He called, that, he, he called for war within the next 48 hours. Um, but the US envoy in Cuba was like, nope, 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 nope. Instead, he writes to the president, um, calls for the USS Maine to set sail from Key West to Havana um, as a precaution. But that doesn't happen right away. Um, by late January, McKinley will become very concerned with a potential secret deal between Spain and Germany. Especially since four German warships have now appeared in the Caribbean. And so there's this, this, this fear of what might, what might happen if these two um, allies. So that, this is about when he finally dispatched, dispatches the main under the guise um, that it's a friendly visit. So he's also under intense pressure from religious groups uh, over Cuba. So both Protestants and Catholics are, are pressuring um, McKinley to act for two very different reasons. Um, for Protestants, it's uh, the fact that they wanted to civilize and quote-unquote uplift uh, the heathens in Cuba, right? They're Catholic, so, right? And then the Catholics wanted uh, the latter to demand, uh, uh, the Catholics wanted, wanted uh, the rescue of the Cuban people, right? So he's got religious groups on very different sides of, of looking at what Christianity is, <laughs> how, they're, how they're viewing each other. It's, 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 it's a mess. But then, of course, right, we know the sinking of the Maine in February of 1898 transforms all of this, right? Um, now, ruled even at the time an accident, right? There's so, uh, 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 in, in March 1898, Spain does their own inquiry and they discover, or what they think they discover is that the gunpowder magazine was stored too close to the coal bunker. 75 years after the fact, right, in the 1970s, we actually do have the Navy doing a proper investigation. And yes, that is in fact what happened, <laughs> is that the, 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 there was a spark from the coal bunker and it ignited the magazine and that's what caused the explosion, right? Um, now, again, in March 1898, the Spanish inquiry had suggested exactly this. Also, uh, US Naval Academy professor Philip Alger um, believed this was the case. He actually wrote to multiple newspapers, like uh, printed editorials, arguing that um, this, is, this, this is what happened. But the US board that investigated uh, used the slimmest of evidence, just this little sliver of ed evidence, to claim that the explosion was initially caused by an underwater mine. Now, they didn't blame Spain at all, and it was also something that absolved the Navy of, of any of this, but McKinley is gonna try to hold back the report, right? It's very clear, this is going to be very bad publicly for him if, if this report gets out too soon and he's not ready to act and he's not ready to, 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 to do what needs to be done and, and have the pieces in place in case war needs to happen, right? So because the report exonerates the Navy, but also didn't blame Spain, uh, he, was, he was really feeling the mood of the nation, and he thought that this was going to be the spark. This was gonna be the thing that set off the country, and there was gonna be no turning back. Now, the report leaked to the press anyway, as it does, right? That's, that's just how this works. Um, it spreads quickly, immediately, and then, of course, the, the war cry that first appears in Hearst's journal. Remember the, hell, the main, to hell with Spain. Right. So between the press, uh, between all the press about uh, about it, um, war-hungry subordinates and attempting to suppress the report, McKinley had to get ahead of the situation uh, in terms of the public eye and how people are looking at this. So once again, Roosevelt found ways to create problems for his president, describing McKinley as quote a jellyfish uh, <laughs> to certain reporters. Uh, that's not, he's, uh, Roosevelt's not the only one who, uh, who will refer to McKinley as a jellyfish, but um, he is one of many. Now, 
in reality, again, McKinley is a skilled politician who shows both strength and finesse in his talks with Spain over Cuba um, to result in this partial autonomy for the island just, just a few months before. But he is now stuck in a no-win situation. Um, you've got a war-hungry populace, a Spanish government refusing to acknowledge the end of its empire, and Cuban re rebels refusing anything less than independence. So after continued negotiations, McKinley finally goes to Congress and asks for military intervention, um, but not a declaration of war. Right? Um, he does not ask for Cuban independence. He does not ask for the recognition of the rebel government. The idea was to maybe leave room for some negotiations with Spain by not declaring any of these things. Right? Um, in part, this is, again, because it it's the fact that McKinley really did agree with many of his fellow politicians. The Cuban people, or at least they thought, the Cuban people were incapable of self-governance. Uh, so instead, they must be guided by others, those more, quote-unquote, evolved people, um, like those in the United States, to get them toward true independence. Like, so, at the same time, politicians fell into about two camps when it came to Cuba. Um, those who um, wanted to, so in this case, is, these are people who were wanting to avoid annexing Cuba. Right? First and foremost, Cubans were fighting a revolution, and therefore they should be independent. Right? Bar none, that's exactly what should happen. Now for others, there's nativism, right? because they're Catholic, and this is also a, a half-black population, right? This is, this is a, a, a population um, that has um, multiple ethnicities and races, so that, that uh, the, the nativist feeling in the time um, really comes out in, in these arguments of avoiding annexing Cuba. And not just Cuba, but Hawaii and the Philippines, and you, you name it, right? It's, it's, all in, it's, it's all connected. So Congress will actually settle on the Teller Amendment to um, prevent the U.S. from annexing Cuba as a colony and declare Cuban independence. Now, McKinley, despite his reservations about what the Teller Amendment has in it, he signs it. So just days later, he will call for about 125,000 volunteers to supplement the very, very small standing army of about 28,000. Right? About one million men enlisted in the newly created regiments, including his assistant secretary of the Navy, <laughs> Roosevelt. Right? So something McKinley then had to contend with was offers from influential and wealthy Americans who, uh, who actually said, hey, yeah, we'll create and we'll, we'll equip um, some, some units in the military. Right? So one of these people, of course, is Hearst. <laughs> who had been lambasting McKinley, right? Just, oh, right, yeah, lamb, lamb, lambasting McKinley for his entire presidency, even during the campaign, right? Um, and so McKinley is gonna, of course, turn down his offer to uh, equip and, 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 and lead a cavalry regiment. Uh, not to be dissuaded, McKinley, turn, uh, McKinley then go, went to the Navy and was like, oh, yeah, yeah, you can have my personal yacht. Right? Like, yeah, you can have my personal yacht. I'll also, like, I'll arm it. I'll turn it into a gunboat. Mm, I should be in command of it, though. It should be fine, right? Right? That'll, that'll work. That'll work. Well, the Navy took the boat and the guns, but then told Hearst that he would have to <laughs> apply for a commission if he wanted to command it. Yeah. Uh, so Hearst goes to Washington. And he sits, and he waits at the Secretary of War's office, waiting to talk to the Secretary of War, just like sitting, in, just sitting and waiting. Um, he's then told that his application would, would have to be sent to a review board to determine if he'd receive a commission or not. Now, Hearst didn't understand why John Jacob Astor, uh, his friend and another very wealthy American, had received a commission as a lieutenant colonel after gifting the Navy a yacht and an artillery battery for the Army. Yeah, but Hearst's commission didn't come through 
until the war ended. <laughs> <laughs> so that's the thing, is it's, it's not clear, but some historians have speculated that potentially this was a way for McKinley to like get back at Hearst a little bit. So by slow rolling his application and, and, and taking this pause, it was a way to punish Hearst for all of the mockery that was going on in uh, the New York Journal. Uh, I, I mean, could you blame him? <laughs> um, so... While McKinley is uh, working to field this larger army uh, and navy to fight Spain, um, he's also wanting to annex Hawaii. Right? Um, this is a turn from the Cleveland administration just before. So Cleveland um, opposed the Dole government, opposed its overthrow of Queen Liliuokalani um, and, and her, her uh, position as, as queen um, and he, so, so Cleveland, he, he only wanted to annex Hawaii if native Hawaiians wanted it, right? That's a complete difference when we get to the McKinley administration because instead, McKinley says, quote, we need Hawaii just as much and a good deal more than we did California. It is manifest destiny. Yeah. Um, so McKinley begins the negotiation pro process to annex the islands as early as June of 1897. So this is a very quick turn from what we were seeing with the Cleveland administration to basically being hands off and, and uh, ignoring the, 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 the Dole government led by Sanford B. Dole, um, whose cousin created the uh, Dole Pineapple Company. Yeah, same family. Um, so, but also, I believe, no relation to... Senator Bob Dole. <laughs> yeah. Uh, um, so um, McKinley told the Hawaiian delegation that, that had arrived shortly after his election that he had, quote, ideas about Hawaii. Uh, but he would, of course, first concentrate on the U.S. economy, right? He's still trying to, to bring the U.S. out of the Panic of 1893. Um, and so his concentration there first made sense. But he was also influenced by the white minority on the islands who argued that the U.S. position on the islands was deteriorating. And especially if Japan seized the islands, because there, there were a number of Japanese immigrants coming to Hawaii, if Japan seized the islands, there would be a potentially powerful adversary that might threaten the West Coast from the Hawaiian islands. Therefore... Um, uh, you combine that with annexationists' use of racial um, constructs to argue that the U.S. needed to annex Hawaii as a way to, quote, rescue, uh, unquote, the white civilization from encroaching Asian expansion. Okay. So um, by the end of 1897, even well before uh, the USS Maine uh, explodes, McKinley had already introduced a treaty to Congress for annexation, most likely as a warning to Japan to not interfere with Hawaii's governance, um, knowing Congress was about to take its holiday. <laughs> so this is like, Dece yeah, this is like early to mid-December, so he, he knows that, that Congress is about to go on holiday um, for, 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 um, um, for the next couple of weeks, and so the treaty would not be ratified that year. But he wanted to introduce it because part of it was just getting, getting this in the mind of Congress, as well as passing off a question, uh, passing off questions to them about what Hawaii would become. Kind of just basically like, hey, we're going to annex it, but I'm going to leave this in your lap. Will Hawaii be a territory? Will it be a state? Would citizenship be conferred upon the island's Asian, uh, Native Hawaiian, and Portuguese majority? He told Congress that determining those answers uh, to those questions, that's their responsibility. Uh, based on, quote, the wisdom of Congress uh, and their ratification of the treaty. Uh, he also hoped that Congress would, quote, avoid the abrupt assimilation of events, uh, of, of elements, perhaps hardly yet fitted to share in the highest franchises of citizenship. So, He's giving Congress a little, bit of, uh, a little bit of leeway here in terms of determining what will happen with Hawaii. Now, he also wants a little bit of local self-governance, particularly because of the Dole government. Um, uh, and he argued that it had, over the past five years, shown a willingness and ability, quote, to fulfill the obligations of self-governing statehood. 
uh, and desire to become part of the United States. Now, of course, in this process, he's prioritizing this white minority, but also um, removing the non-white majority from discussions of annexation, but also, at the same time, ignoring all of their years of self-governance prior to this. Right? So it's, it's, it's a nice, complicated mess, I guess, to, to, <laughs> to put it mildly. Um, now, the annexation resolution will eventually pass in June of 1898, and it's signed by McKinley um, in about July. And so this is amidst the buildup of the invasion of Cuba. And so this seems, right, like an odd political maneuver if you're just looking at when he's annexing it. But um, this isn't as sudden as it seems, right? This is, this is building up for many years. Um, and so one of, of course, the roadblocks for him was uh, the Speaker of the House, Thomas Reed. Um, um, but in, in the end, um, McKinley got it past him, and, and the U.S. will eventually annex Hawaii. Now, when the splendid little war ends, these negotiations now turn toward the Philippines and understanding what's going to happen there. Um, and so annex for annexationists, it's, it's very much a, a, a question of how will the Monroe Doctrine apply beyond the Caribbean. Will it apply beyond the Caribbean? Is that is it even possible? Right. So what the treaty will do um, when it's finally negotiated and signed is that it will um, turn over. Con it will um, have Spain cede control entirely of Cuba, turn over control of Puerto Rico, other any other islands in the West Indies that they still controlled, as well as Guam to the United States, and then sell the Philippines to the United States for about $20 million, okay? Now, this is something that McKinley kind of says that uh, he, he wasn't necessarily looking to do, but um, the buildup to it is actually longer than we tend to think about it, right? Um, a man, for a man who jokingly kind of said that he couldn't guess where the Philippines were within 2,000 miles, um, he's now at the center of negotiations for this and, 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 and claiming these islands for the United States. Um, and so for him beforehand, he's got just a couple of choices and for many, it, 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 it just seems unfeasible, right? He could return the Philippines to Spain, but he thought that would be immoral and inconsistent with the Teller Amendment. Um, he could allow Filipino independence, but that um, was uh, very similar to Cuba in that he doubted the possibility of self-governance. Right? And so in the end, um, it was, well, do we split power, uh, control of the territory with another nation? Well, we tried that, and it nearly led to war over Samoa. So um, it then became that the, um, the U.S. would take control. Initially, he just wanted um, the island of Luzon for military bases. But it became, like, what do you do with the rest of the islands? How does this look? And so um, for McKinley... Um, even though the U.S. didn't want partial or full annexation before the war, quote, the presence and success of our arms at Manila imposes upon us obligations which we cannot disregard, right? So he's already thinking about this, and, it, and um, historian Eric Lev will actually assert um, that McKinley was already at the conclusion that the U.S. would need to um, annex the Philippines when he undertook an October 1898 campaign tour, um, specifically because of the president's emotion, uh, uh, appeals to emotion and rallying sentiment, rather than informing the public in any of the speeches that he gives along this campaign tour. So when the December Treaty goes into effect, right, then it becomes, and then it gets thrown to Congress. What are you gonna do with this? How are you going to treat these people? Are they going to be citizens? Is this a state? Is it a colony? What is going to happen? Are they going to be, become citizens? But then you also have Filipino nationalists who want independence. Um, and so it, with that thrown into the mix, you then have two days. So two days before the treaty is ratified, that is when fighting breaks out in the Philippines between uh, Filipino nationalists and the U.S. military there uh, as the occupation forces. Two days. Just two days. So, if you vote in favor of the treaty, you're patriotic. If you vote against it, you're voting, your vote means that you are hostile to American soldiers. 
right? So uh, it, it, it becomes like a, a really easy thing for McKinley uh, to, to get that passed. But there's also some um, assertions by some that he, uh, he and his administration seemingly bought off votes in the Senate. Um, so like eh, federal judge appointments, things like that, right? Um, now, for the rest of McKinley's presidency, he is a wartime leader. Right, because it goes just from the Spanish-American War almost right into the Philippine-American War. And he's attempting to wrestle with control of the Philippines away from, from Filipino nationalists led by um, Emiliano uh, Aguinaldo. He also continued this economic expansion that he inherited from previous presidents with a particular focus now on East Asia. Um, and tr essentially trying to forestall any types of economic restrictions to free trade typically seen within the spheres of influence that were created by European and Asian imperial powers. Now specifically, right, we, we tend to associate it, it instead with Secretary of State Hay, but the open door policy is something very much the McKinley administration was in favor of, um, particularly because it, was, it would acknowledge and recognize China's sovereignty and not allow the imposition of economic exclusion zones that were seen elsewhere um, as uh, imperial powers were carving up the rest of the world, right? So because of this interest in China, it's also McKinley who then sets a very new precedent for American presidents. Sending the military abroad without consulting the legislative branch. Ah, yes, the Boxer Rebellion. Um, he will send 5,000 American troops to go and help uh, quell that, but um, he then goes right back to championing the open door policy. And so his presidency ends with an assassin's uh, two bullets uh, at the Pan American um, Exposition, and it then falls to his vice president, Theodore Roosevelt, uh, to figure out what to do next. Um, and so McKinley tends to be kind of overlooked, and his presidency kind of overlooked, like, right? He's characterized as this puppet, almost, for these strong personalities um, in his administration and um, uh, American politics writ large, but as we can see, he's very, he was very smart, savvy, and able, uh, and an able politician that really sets the stage for the U.S. to become a far more prominent power as we move into the 20th century through economic and military expansion abroad in creating what Thomas Jefferson referred to as the empire of liberty. Thank you. And please join us next time as well for Dr. Bab's talk on Chiang Kai-shek and Mao Zedong. I'm happy to take any questions. Uh, uh, was there any discussion about annexing Cuba and making that a part of a territory? <sighs> oh, yes, <laughs> absolutely. Um, there was discussion of it, but uh, the Teller Amendment made sure that that wasn't going to happen. Um, by, doing so, by, by doing that and passing the Teller Amendment, it assured that absolutely no matter what, Cuba would not be annexed by the United States. Now, that didn't necessarily meant that it would automatically go towards self-governance, Right? And the U.S. does keep a very large economic presence and, and, and foothold in Cuba for a very long time, right? And, and through that is able to control a lot of what Cuba does and does not do. Additionally, there's a military occupation of Cuba in the aftermath, so there's a military government that is set up um, as it is moving out of uh, wartime into peacetime and, and, and all of that. But yet, yeah, simply because of the Teller Amendment and that specific language in there that, no, 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 we're not going to annex Cuba, that is what then um, appeared in the Treaty of Paris in December of 1898, was that the, the, the U.S. will not, like, Spain has to relinquish control over it, but the U.S. isn't taking control of it, right? So that's, that's kind of how that played out. Uh, first of all, I enjoyed your uh, presentation very much. Uh, you pointed out that uh, uh, McKinley's uh, days as a politician uh, were ended at the Pan-American Exposition mm -hmm. when he was assassinated uh, with two shots. Yes. 
And uh, my question is, uh, uh, who shot him and why? <laughs> and uh, whether the assassination itself had any uh, repercussions uh, that you know of. Uh, I am not, I'm going to slaughter the man's last name. He, he's <laughs> he was a Czech immigrant, uh, Leon, oh shit, oh, I'm going to slaughter it. I will absolutely slaughter his last name. That is why I didn't include it. <laughs> um, uh, I would have to sp phonetically spell it out. Um, he was actually influenced by Emma Goldman uh, by hearing some of her, her, her uh, talking points. And so, uh, so he was kind of, uh, kind of an anarchist. Uh, it, it, he was influenced by um, the anarchist um, sentiment that was growing in not just the United States, but in Europe as well. And so after hearing Emma Goldman talk about um, McKinley and things like that, he decided, he absolutely decided that's exactly what he needed to do, was he needed to find a way at the, the exposition to, uh, to kill McKinley. And so he tried, he, his first attempt was uh, he couldn't get close enough. And then the second time, he, he was able to get off two shots before, um, um, before they, they, uh, they disarmed him. Um, he was then tried and convicted um, uh, and executed within the same year. So it's all, this is all in 1901. So this is September of 1901 that McKinley is assassinated. And by, I think it's by October, um, uh, his first name is Leon. I'm, I, I, I cannot give you his last name. I can see it in my head, but I cannot tell you how to, sp uh, how, how to pronounce it. <laughs> um, <laughs> it's, it's, <laughs> it's driving me nuts. But yeah, he, um, he, he was executed in, in October of 1898. Or sorry, eight, not 1898, 1901. All, my, all the dates are floating in my head. Um, but yeah, that, that, so that was kind of um, what happened there. But the implication more than anything was that Teddy Roosevelt is now president. And many people in the Republican Party were like, what? We, we, ha we have him now? What are we going to do? Um, and and most, people, most people did not think very highly of Roosevelt. He was such a passionate individual um, and very boisterous. And so because of that, people, people, were not people in his party were not exactly happy about the fact that not only was he, in 1900 and 1901, one heartbeat away from the presidency, but then now, as of September of 1901, the president. Um, but what he actually does is introduce and usher in um, progressive reforms in the United States. So there's a lot of stuff that happens um, for the benefit of, of, of many Americans because of what he does. So um, he's part of the conservation, right? He, he's the reason we have so many national parks around the country. He, uh, he uh, in 1906, um, pioneered and, and uh, signed the Pure Food and Drug Act, um, to make sure that food was um, properly edible <laughs> for Americans and you didn't have um, specific additives that, that would be harmful, all those sorts of things. So he's, he's going to be um, 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 that, uh, just a, a progressive reformer and, and focused on those sorts of things to, to, to try to bring and usher in the progressive era for the United States. Yeah. <laughs> you just asked your question. <laughs> All right. President McKinley uh, became president largely mm -hmm. over the economic arguments of the mm -hmm. election of 1896, particularly the Panic of 1893, mm -hmm. the Pullman strike, and the gold mm -hmm. versus silver controversy. Mm -hmm. So what were the economic arguments that impelled um, President McKinley to war and to the military objectives that he decided upon? Well, in part, it has to do with the economic expansion that had already occurred, right? So specifically Hawaii, the United States had been sending uh, missionaries to the islands since the 1830s, right? Um, add in economic expansion, so the, the focus on um, natural resources that can be extracted. Um, so again, the, the Dole Company, uh, among many others, so sugar, um, all sorts of um, other products that can be pulled from, from these, these islands, that was what, uh, that was, what was driving um, um, th this, 
this interest in, but then also because of all this economic expansion into these areas, this would then drive um, further economic development for the United States. And so protecting those interests became important. Therefore, now he had to figure out how to also um, field an ar a big enough army, field a navy, marines, et cetera, to be able to project that power and actually expand and, and, and protect investments abroad. And so that's part of where that, that argument comes from, particularly for Hawaii. Now, it's the same, it's similar in Cuba, just because of so much, uh, so, so much financial and investment interests in the island, particularly when it came to sugar um, and rum, like you know, pick, pick, your <laughs> um, pick your crop um, that, that will come from there. That, that's, that's, that's why, more than anything, was he was focused on those sorts of economic benefits to the United States that if this investment abroad, um, as well as bringing in, say, cheaper, um, uh, cheaper goods, to then be able to produce things uh, more, uh, more um, efficiently and affordably to the American public, that could then be part of what brings out um, the uh, brings the U.S. out of the panic. Now, the other thing too is that he was actually um, uh, very effective as the Ohio governor in dealing with some of the strikes, the labor, the labor unrest, and actually negotiating between the labor union. And, uh, and 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 um, the 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 businessmen who uh, were running certain companies in in the state of Ohio, he was actually very good at that. Um, and um, while the union didn't get necessarily all of the things they wanted, right? He he forced both to come to the table and get there. Um, so he already had that background of being able to do some of these sorts of things um, when he became president. So he brought in that as well as this this. Um, the, the fact that the U.S. had already, under previous administrations, been spreading abroad economically, sp uh, specifically, um, to, to be able to do that. Okay, I think I've been given the wrap it up uh, signal. <laughs> so thank you very much for coming out today. I appreciate it. Thank you.